think you've retired. Who wants to face a guy like that? Would you want to face a guy like that? That's what it'll be like when he's on the streets. He has no feelings. That's what I retain from everything I've seen. He's numb. I wouldn't want to be in front of him, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone else. Maybe it's tedious, but there are too many still hanging out on the streets. He is accused of first-degree murder of 12 other women. Please talk to my lawyer and please leave me alone. Suspected of a double murder. Nine charges of murder have been laid against William Fine. Everyone is fascinated by psychopathy and by psychopaths. Everyone is fascinated by this overflow of the human psyche that results in repulsive acts. It is sometimes said, accurately I believe, that around 60 or 70 percent of our problems are caused by 1 percent of the population, meaning 1 percent is made up of psychopaths, whether on an economic level, a sexual level, or a societal level. There's always a psychopath at work somewhere in the background. This 1% is made up mostly of males. Some writers even talk of nine men to one woman. What pretty much all psychopaths have in common is that they will always seek power. You can tell when someone is looking for power, looking to gain influence over you, to control you, manipulate you, to feed a need. Maybe they take advantage of you financially or on a sexual level. We feel we're a sexual object for them. When they don't get what they want, they put us down, they humiliate us. The psychopaths are among us. And the more knowledge we have, and the more we uh, wake up and smell the coffee as it comes to the psychopath, we will, we will be able to protect ourselves and our family. When you understand that this is a person who has emotion, a lot of people say, oh, a psychopath has no emotion. That's wrong. They have a lot of emotion, just not for you. Emotion is all about me, right? For all psychopaths, there is this absence of emotional empathy. And, uh, but they have cognitive empathy, which means they know what you're thinking. They don't feel what you're thinking. What you'd say is a good person would use that knowledge to help you. I understand your problem, and now I'm gonna help you solve that problem when I can. But I'm not crying listening to your story. And people with personality disorders that are dangerous, narcissistic personality disorder, uh, also has this, this lack of emotional empathy that with other traits then becomes pernicious and, and predatory. We, yes, obviously the psychopath is grappling with a strange psychological condition. He's not a madman. He doesn't talk gibberish. He's not raving. His causality is completely intact. He has both feet on the ground. He just doesn't care about anyone else. Much more than that, he exploits others, either for profit or, more likely, for pleasure. While William Fife now stands accused in the serial killing of three women, investigation continues into a haunting string of others in Quebec and Ontario. considered one of Canada's worst serial killers. I couldn't believe it, not Bill. 
He was someone who was such a nice, quiet guy. I hung out with the guy. He really didn't let on as to what he was. Among the so-called narcissistic pathologies, the psychopath is certainly the most dangerous because of his propensity to act, because of the pleasure he derives from hurting others. After 48 hours on the run, police finally catch the janitor of a Montreal building suspected of carrying out a double murder. It all began in this house, Monday morning. In the janitor's lodgings, police found the bodies of two men who had been strangled. One was the owner, Jean-Pierre Mas, 37, and the other a friend of the janitor, Michel Mansfield, 24. Prime suspect, Paul Shaker, 31, a habitual offender, was arrested in Estrie on Wednesday after taking a Windsor family hostage. He was our little brother, the youngest, my mother's baby. For me, then for his wife, it was the same. I could talk about my mother, who had heart attack after heart attack and was then mortgaged to the hilt. It took a very long time to get over. Public records on Paul Shaker say that he was previously diagnosed as a psychopath. In criminality terms, we do notice a diversity of offenses that seem to have been committed in a relatively insensitive manner, as well as the cruelty shown in the homicides committed. He took away someone dear to me, which made me feel truly angry. It's an experience I wouldn't wish on anybody. It stays with you your whole life long. Jones was a well-liked financial advisor in Montreal's West End. Some estimate he was handling up to $50 million belonging to close friends and family. Is he a narcissist? Certainly, yes. Is the gentleman a pathological liar? Certainly. I can't. But I didn't go from London to England. I haven't been over Montreal. Did he manipulate every situation? Yes, clearly. Is there any empathy? Not in my opinion. Is there an absence of remorse? Certainly. I never saw any remorse from this gentleman. I want to cooperate, and I'll tell you the truth. The idea of a uh, violence of psychopaths, you know, everybody has a, a different sort of sense of this. There's physical violence and sexual violence, but a lot of psychopathy is not that at all. There are psychopaths that are sadistic, and there are psychopaths that are violent. But it's not a core trait. The public easily confuses the psychopath with the madman. A great many crimes, often very serious, are perpetrated by someone who has lost the plot psychologically, that is, who is schizophrenic with attendant delusions and hallucinations. Marc Lépine, that's the name of the man who yesterday killed 14 women at the École Polytechnique de Montréal. It can result in lots of crimes, mass murder, for example, or incomprehensible crimes with lots of blood and knives and children killed, etc. Often, the public thinks, that's too much. It's the work of a psychopath. Not at all, in fact, because very often those crimes are gratuitous, 
The psychopath doesn't do senseless or incomprehensible murders. We understand these murders all too well because their causality is intact. Picton was charged with killing 26 women, all former sex trade workers, drug addicts from Vancouver's downtown east side. Picton was a psychopath. Picton was a collector of prostitutes. He would take his pleasure, take their lives, and feed their flesh to his pigs. And he counted them. He knew he'd reached exactly 49 and was very proud of that. He told his pal in prison it was a shame he did not reach a round number, 50. I've heard people say, uh, well, I knew he was a psychopath instantly, and I'm going, right. No, no, it doesn't work that way. Or I had somebody say to me, you know, I looked in, I looked in his eyes, and I saw the psychopath, and I said, no, no. I said, what did you see in that person's eyes? Well, it was that kind of dead look, like I could just bore a hole right through you. I said, well, that's not the psychopath. When, when I meet a psychopath, when I'm interviewing a psychopath for an assessment, Man, their eyes are alive, they're dancing. They're trying to con me. They're not sitting there trying to bore a hole through me. They're trying to con me. They want me to like them. These people are chameleons and they're good at con. And they will try to con you. So, so to say that you can look in their eyes and see evil, ah, not buying it, not buying it. It's important to wonder what psychopathy is, how you'd conceptualize it. And the best conceptualization of psychopathy to date, with the best consensus, is the hair psychopathy checklist. 20 characteristics are assessed from 0 to 2, giving a maximum total score of 40. A subject who scores 30 or more out of 40 is diagnosed as a psychopath. In Europe, it's 25. In North America, 30. Psychopathy, a lot of people say, well, you're either a psychopath or you're not. So we're going to score you, and if you score a 30 out of a possible 40, you're a psychopath. If you score less, you're not a psychopath. That's not true. This is a continuum from 0 to 40. And the higher you are up the continuum, the more psychopathic traits you have the more chances that you're going to act like a psychopath. Factor one is the personality. Factor two is the lifestyle. And so some of the pieces of the factor one personality would be glib and superficial charm, grandiose sense of self-worth. And then you go over to the lifestyle and you're looking at poor behavioral controls, uh, irresponsibility. Most people, uh, general public, most people would score, you know, somewhere maybe between six and 10. I remember scoring myself back when I first started. And let me just say this, I was over 10. Um, but I certainly wasn't near the cutoff. You can probably find psychopaths everywhere. But you mainly find them among criminals, that is, people who have made crime and the exploitation of others their stock in trade. But you also risk finding psychopaths in other, far more respectable areas, I would say. They're probably psychopaths who have managed to give their quest for power and their quest for pleasure a much more socially acceptable form. I'm thinking of lawyers. I'm thinking of police officers. I'm thinking of big business. 
I'm thinking of the media, especially those with lots of visibility. You see, these are the jobs where a psychopath can be successful. He is often number one, where he advances a lot, but in his own furrow. And he's used to using his elbows to progress, so you may find a lot of broken shells in his wake. Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? It's like incredible. Obviously, when it's public figures, we can't afford to diagnose just any public figure. We need to do a formal assessment. But it's certain that, as several people have surely noticed, Donald Trump can present certain traits associated with psychopathy. I'm not saying he's a psychopath, but some psychologists in the United States, psychiatrists too, have advanced this argument to explain his personality. Many have dubbed him a narcissist. Some have gone so far as to mention psychopathy. When you watch Donald Trump at work, lots of his behavior is characteristic. It's a pure theft in American history. Everybody knows it. That election, our election, was over at 10 o'clock in the evening. So if we're talking pathological liars, I think everyone has noticed that he is someone who lies repeatedly. He's one of the best examples of a public figure lying. But that's typical of psychopaths. When they're caught lying, there's no shame, no guilt. It's like nothing happened. He said, I think Donald Trump is an artful liar. I think he is a greedy, vicious, and arrogant man. Well, I don't know, is that supposed to be a compliment or not? I'm, I'm not sure. Several times we saw the lack of empathy. There were allegations of sexual offenses by at least 25 women. I have no idea who these women are. I have no idea. Believe me, she would not be my first choice, that I can tell you. In about 2005, I've gone through about 16 years of looking at the brain scans of murderers, serial killers. Here is a uh, positron emission tomography scan of two normal people compared to a psychopath. Yellow is kind of normal, red is kind of higher activity. Uh, anything in blue or darker is very low. This is a visual uh, stimuli used for the PET, PET scan, and they're evocative, they're, you know, emotional scans, so they really turn on this whole visual system, uh, and they're normally things that get people's attention, but they might also get upset about. And here is a psychopath, where all of, the, here up in the frontal lobe, and what's called the anterior cingulate, uh, is turned off. If you showed somebody being cut open or violently attacked, most people that would have that part of their brain, emotional brain, turned on. But a psychopath, it's like they're looking at nothing. It's like, oh, that's, you know, they're looking at a flower. In 2005, I get a whole load of these, a lot of these scans of different murders. We were also doing a study on Alzheimer's, completely separate. But at any rate, uh, we had run out, we didn't have enough controls of normal people in the experiments. So I brought my family in, including myself, some of our kids, my brothers. And the PET scans were brought to me by two technicians. When I got to the end of this pile, there was one there, uh, one scan, and I just, and I looked at these technicians, I said, this, this is hysterical, guys. You've got one of the psychopathic killers. I said, this scan is obvious, this guy, can't be walking around in open society as a very dangerous person, probably. And uh, they go, no, 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 this is one of your family. And it was ridiculous. So when I knew that, I had to peel back the tape over the name of who it was. And it was my name. kind of paraphrase what one uh, psychiatrist said, who, who knows a lot about me and, and after analyzing it, said, look, at, here's somebody who has completely psychopathic thoughts and dreams and urges all the time. 
And it's not like the average person. They're really bad. You know, they're really sick. He just never acts them out. He's able to inhibit them. But certainly uh, bubbling beneath there is this, you know, a cold predator, if you will. William Five, William Five showed up randomly at his victims' homes, offering to do odd jobs. Between mid-October and mid-December 1999, Five murdered with unheard of fury four women who lived alone. They were stabbed, beaten to death, and strangled. A number of psychopaths managed to lead a double life. William Fife is probably the most famous serial killer in Quebec's history. Between 1979 and 99, he committed nine homicides on women, some of these involving sexual assault. William Fife was diagnosed as a psychopath. The diagnosis was made in Saskatchewan. Five hounded his victims, who fought back with the energy of despair. William Five's modus operandi of serial murders with sexual offenses is relatively typical of what we find in sexual assailants, in sadistic rapists. They'll have deviant fantasies that they need to indulge. They'll experience sexual arousal by making their victims suffer. Then they'll reproduce the behavior over and over. William Fife seemed to have this side where he had a double life. He had quite a normal social life. So he had a wife, children, a proper job, went to family reunions. No one suspected that this person led a double life. They don't want to get caught, so they'll successfully project that image, then at the same time have their delinquent lives. I didn't tell my wife what I was doing. And I started to carefully monitor uh, my interactions with her every day. And I would try to do what I thought empathic, really good fathers uh, would do, and, uh, and husbands. And so I tried to do that. I tried to mimic that. Poured wine for her before me, simple things. Uh, and then I, I also mixed it in with things like going to you know, going to funerals I didn't want to go to or going to events that she wanted, you know, that were important to her because I could blow these off easily. <laughs> and then after a couple of months, she said to me, without knowing this, I mean, what I was doing, and she goes, God, you're such a nice guy. What the hell happened, you know? And I said, but don't take it seriously because I'm just, you know, I'm mimicking it and I'm just trying to test it out. <laughs> and the best part of this is that she goes, I don't care. She says, I like what you're doing. She, and I said, you don't care that it's insincere? She goes, absolutely not. I just want you to treat me better. Huh. And I always thought that you had to be sincere, sincere about you know, treating people better as opposed to mimicking it. And it turns out that most people just want to be treated better and they don't care why the hell you're doing it. They use the expression snakes in suits about people who have psychopathic tendencies. So a lack of empathy, manipulation for their own ends, the need to control, to climb the ranks in an unhealthy, toxic way. They exist and they do a lot of damage. It can hurt a lot to realize after several years that you've invested in a relationship with someone who has psychopathic tendencies. It's a rude awakening. The corporate psychopath, or the snakes in suits, if you will, those are people who are able to feign interest in other people in order to get what they want. I would say that um, the psychopath has has a limited capacity and and a very limited capacity to feel empathy for another person they care about self and they can feign interest in somebody else and they can actually show a, a nurturing self 
to somebody if it fits within the plan for themselves. The, the white collar psychopath will be able to, to hold what we call a modicum of success, both in their own personal life and in their public life. Typically what we see in organizational psychopaths is they have a veneer, they have a shell, they have a great first impression, but if they stay in a place long enough, somebody's gonna see behind the shell. And so they move a lot. Once hired, it's divide and conquer, self-promotion, taking down the more threatening people around them, even sabotaging their work. So they make their way, but follow a fairly toxic path. They leave a trail of collateral damage, and what they want is always more power, and they're ready to destroy everything to get where they want to go. Disgraced financial advisor Earl Jones pleaded guilty today to defrauding more than 150 clients to the tune of more than $50 million. I started by meeting his wife, who had picked up our landscaping business card for the maintenance of their garden here in Le Maître. I met Maxine Jones first. They were both absolutely lovely people, always very friendly, very quiet. He was quite charming, a very kind, courteous, interesting gentleman, a good conversationalist. We looked after his garden for a year or two, but in between I spoke to my mother, who explained to me who he was how she had known him, etc., and that she still had investments with him. He offered me his advice on investing, and that's how the meeting went. One Friday evening, after doing a new landscaping job on the property he owned in Le Maître, It'd been a few weeks. We found that odd because he usually called back real quick. And in a week, we'd be paid. Then, for three or four weeks, we left messages, and he didn't call me back. But he owed us a lot of money, several thousand dollars for the work. So Friday night, I'm having supper. My son, who lives upstairs, calls in and says, You see that, Mom? Earl! What about Earl? Earl? He's a crook. What? What are you on about? Turn on the TV news. So I turn off the stove, turn on the news, and see that. Earl Jones cheated his victims and spent their money lavishly. For 27 years, Jones imitated his signatures and withdrew millions from the account without being troubled by the bank. I would never, ever have believed it. He cheated his own brother. Who would have known? None of us will ever be the same. No matter how you say, we'll forget about it, uh, uh, it it's not going to happen. In the case of Earl Jones, I can't put my name to a diagnosis. I didn't assess him. I didn't observe him. I didn't speak to him. Of course, it's easy to hypothesize a psychopathic tendency when you see a pattern, a history, where there's been manipulation and lies spread over several years. And what's more, with an absence of remorse or regret. Mr. Jones, at one point, worked for the Montreal Trust Company and worked in inheritance. He left Montreal Trust and set up his own business. He began with certain estates. Then he began to make investments for people privately and mix the money from all these estates and investments in one pot. 
he began using the money for his own ends. I did it. I did it because of my cash flow and the necessity of paying what I had to pay. It's called a Ponzi scheme. All it does is take new money from new estates or new investments to supposedly pay a return on old investments. Even though he knows what is right and what is wrong, what is criminal and what is not criminal, there has never been anything in his brain that said, stop, you can't cross that line. Earl Jones was sentenced to 11 years in prison for his fraud. He pleaded guilty of fraud to the tune of $50 million. And for the 158 victims, the sentence is disappointing. Their troubles aren't over. From working all your life and, and doing everything right, then all of a sudden you have nothing. And that's what we have, absolutely nothing. For 35 years he did that. He never invested his clients' money. Never. Jamais, jamais. I didn't take clients' money and invest it into stocks, bonds, um, real estate. He came to cheat me, then my mother. He convinced elderly people who had their big houses paid off to take out a mortgage on it to invest better, to leave their children a better inheritance and all that. For 35 years, the merry-go-round continued. What really gave people confidence was that you had interest checks from Royal Bank that stated the account was Earl Jones in trust. And what we found out later was that these weren't trust accounts. The bank printed that for him, but it was an ordinary private account. Then he'd go there with his ATM card and pull out hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was his card. These people were abused. They were robbed, cleaned out, their lives destroyed. So that's a form of violence, too. When he came out of the courthouse and everyone was there, he was surrounded. They walked him very fast, his lawyer's car, because everyone was after him. And I was raging mad. I was in such a fury that I couldn't help myself. I spat on him. Dr. Jones, are you I spat on him. I have the right to my opinion, I have the right to be upset, so I spat. He's a rat, and that's what you do to rats, you spit on them. It's all I could find to express my anger. After 48 hours on the run, the police finally picked up the janitor of a Montreal building, suspected of being the perpetrator of a double murder. My brother owned an income property, so he was looking for a janitor. Paul Shaker showed up. He hired him. He himself didn't know Paul Shaker, the guy he hired, who didn't volunteer any information either. Because, we found out later, he was on a social reintegration program. At first, my brother was a bit naive. But he wasn't aware of anything. My brother and I spent the weekend together. That morning, my brother got a call from Paul Shaker saying there were problems in the building. So he drove over to see what the problem was. Paul Shaker had planned everything. He was waiting for him with another person. My brother never got out of there. He was strangled with the cords from the vertical blinds. You know those cords? I followed the trial after that. I went to every parole hearing. That's where we learned he'd already been in jail. That he'd stolen, he'd raped, he'd abducted. 
He took drugs, he sold drugs, the works. Then he reached the stage of killing. Paul Shaker began his criminal career very early. He was a minor when he sexually assaulted a 15-year-old girl. For this first crime, he was sentenced in 1979 to 22 months in prison. It set the tone for a dozen years to come. He started from that sexual assault and reached a double murder for which he's still incarcerated today. Paul Shaker is a heavy drug user, so he sets out to find money in drugs and steals drugs and money from his drug dealer. He lures them to his home on the Boulevard Saint-Joseph with Paul Beda, another guy from Sherbrooke who has minor mental health issues and is therefore easily manipulated. One thing Shaker likes to do is manipulate people. He manages to involve Bédard in this plot and lures Michel Mansfield to Shaker's home on Boulevard Saint-Joseph. Together they tie Mansfield to a chair and then cut his throat. Later they put him in the closet. Then as he still needs money, they lure Jean-Pierre Mas, Paul Shaker's landlord, to the apartment and inflict on him the same fate as Mansfield. In other words, they kill him too. I have a son who's disabled, physically and also mentally. So when I saw that he had used that person, I was horrified, because these are vulnerable people. You don't touch these people. That man had the IQ of a seven-year-old child, but he was six foot tall, whereas Paul Shaker's like five foot three. So he used this person, who's mentally disabled, to kill. But he was sentenced too. He went to prison too. But it wasn't his fault. It was the other one who planned it. He was sentenced to 25 years, and that was 30 years ago. The parole board made it clear to me that one day we'd have to deal with it. They can't keep him forever, even if he's considered a dangerous offender. That's how it is. I've always followed him. I followed him because I'm one of the victims. I'm one of the victims, so the minute he asked for something, they'd have to notify me, so I'd show up. So it was there that I quietly learned that he's a psychopath. Those people are ready to do anything to get something. The last meeting I had, he spoke to say that he was worried about my niece. I was surprised because he was aware he'd taken the father from a young child. It was as if it was all resurfacing. And what effect did it have? You think, is he manipulating or is this the real deal? I don't know. I still don't know because I'm not in that area. But he came back to it. He came after me. The psychopath is 2.5 times more likely to get parole. And so, what's that about? Well, it's simply an artifact of, I can con the National Parole Board. I can con my parole officer. I can call, con the probation. I can con the, the psychologist that's doing my, my assessment. And uh, they have shown themselves to be good at it and thus more likely to get, uh, to get parole. He'll use almost any means to come, because he wants to become credible so he can get out. They know very well how to play with that. He cares nothing of the fate of others. It's his own fate that interests him, and that's all. 
He focuses on that, seduction through manipulation. That's what he does. You know, it's hard to admit that someone who understands psychopathy uh, can be conned by a psychopath, but I have been. As a matter of fact, I, I lost a, a fair bit of money in, in a fraud, in what we call a, a, an affiliation fraud, where I was coaching hockey. The person who was, who was the, the treasurer of the association that we had, um, they were dealing with the money, and she, she actually conned me out of a large amount of money on the private side, and I, I didn't wake up to the fact that she had a lot of psychopathic traits because we were close. Um, we were friends. Uh, it, was, it wasn't a context that I was looking for the psychopath in, and so I got nailed. So, yeah, anybody can get hit with these guys. You know, the one-on-one -on -one psychopath is the nicest person you can imagine. He is talkative, extraordinarily charming. He involves us as well. He gives us the narcissistic food for us to love him. And still, one-on-one, -on -one, automatically, we find him extraordinarily friendly and smart. And we love him. Of course, it's possible we have not understood. Because he gives us all this narcissistic food, the better to manipulate us and to exploit us. Jones abused the trust of 158 investors and robbed them out of $50 million. I've known Earl for a long time. Earl was a very good friend of the family, a very good friend to my father and mother. My mother saw Earl as a brother. Earl, to me, he was Uncle Earl. We weren't family, but he was very close. He was godfather to my brother, and we had lots of good times together and he was someone close. We had lots of fun with Earl and the Jones family. Earl was someone who loved to tell stories and made lots of jokes. He was very funny, charming, and it was always nice when we were in the company of Earl, Maxine, and the two girls. Earl, Maxine, and the two girls. After a time, as a teenager, our priorities were different. His daughters were younger, so we saw the family a little less. A lot of time had gone by, but when my daddy died, Earl came to the funeral. He was super kind, super nice, and at the funeral he said, look, can I help you settle your daddy's inheritance? We had the impression Earl had our interests at heart. He really took advantage of that moment to exploit our trust in him.